Well, good morning and welcome to another week of Journey with Christ. <clears throat> My name is Mark Mitchell. I'm the preaching minister at the Park Avenue Church of Christ and acting as host today for our show. I am joined as usual by Steve Fox, a preacher for over 50 years in the Canal Valley. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing okay, except for the three feet of snow I had to get off my car before I could drive here this morning. Oh, the, the kids like are happy, that. aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, uh, they yeah. I mean, they had a snow day and didn't even plan on it. <laughs> my mother used to say, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? I said, well, you don't have to go out and shovel it for two hours. <laughs> of course it's beautiful to you. You're just going to stay here. And, uh, I grew up in Cleveland. If I never see another snowflake the rest of my life, I'll be tickled to death. Uh, no, Do you yeah. like snow? Um... I did, yeah. I, this kind of snow I don't mind. I didn't have to. I don't have to dr uh, shovel a driveway. Uh, I had to sweep it off my car, and it looks really pretty in the trees and the <coughs> it grass. Does. It looks pretty. Uh, those, those. If you're going to have snow, these is the kind I like. But the part that I don't like is the cold weather that comes with it. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah. I, like I said, I grew up in Cleveland. I've been cold in 50 years. <laughs> People down here go, man, it's cold. It's 40. You got to go someplace where you're waiting on for a bus and it's minus 5. Then then you're cold. Uh, one time I had to go pick up some stuff in Cleveland. And I went in January. And uh, the guy said, that sent me, said, now, dress warm. I'm like, oh, come on, give me a break. And sure enough, the place where I went to pick up material was on was the docks near the lake. I stepped out of that vehicle <laughs> and like to died. Yep. <laughs> like to froze right there where I stood. I have been to a Cleveland Indians baseball game when it was 30 degrees in July. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my grandpa used to say Cleveland had uh, two seasons. They have winter and it, in July. <laughs> That's what you got if you live there. <laughs> yep. Well, we're well we better get, get to Revelation. Right? Yeah, we better get started. Uh, being as, and we have, we're glad you're back, even though we kind of took a week off. That was so that one guy, me, could re <laughs> rejuvenate himself. He's he was tired. He was wore out. Uh, last well, week we finished with Revelations chapter six. Uh, we opened a lot of seals <clears throat> last week. Lots of seals. And before we get to the seals, let me, let me mention one personal note. I hope everybody had a really nice Thanksgiving. The way the world is, it, we need something like Thanksgiving. We need oh, something man. like... And I know there's a big argument about do we go to the family or do we not go to the family? Do we stay home or do we not stay home? Everybody had to decide that as an individual family. But I learned... <clears throat> when you read Revelation, I guarantee you, you'll learn stuff every time you read it. Oh, Nobody yeah. has that figured out. I learned something very significant. Um, Susie and I have 10 grandkids, and our 10 grandkids were there at our house for four days. <laughs> and you talk about a sanity clause. <laughs> <laughs> we could not have had a better Thanksgiving because of the fact that all 10 of them were there. And they're cousins, and they love each other, and that, and that makes it work out really well. But. Um, as I was reading through here and trying to study for this class, uh, something hit me, and I wanted to share it with you. We'll, we'll get there in a minute, but it's Revelation 8, verse 1. This is what it says. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. He was not writing about the Fox family when he wrote, when he wrote that <laughs> verse. Because it, didn't, it might be 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. Somebody was talking to somebody. Yeah. And, so he must have been talking about, we'll, we'll get there in a little bit, but there was silence in heaven for half an hour. That did not include the Fox family. No, no, no. no I can, and at my house it would be uh, pretty good too because we, we have a few talkers in, in, our, in our family too. And as we cover chapter 7 and chapter 8 this morning, um, I want you to know that I have a, dis a distinct advantage because about mm, 10 years ago at a church in Managua, Nicaragua, three nights in a row, they asked me to preach, they asked me to teach a class on Revelation. So I taught the class in Spanish, 
So I'm not only confused in one language, I'm confused in two <laughs> languages. Yeah. Well, I've got your one up because you're only confused in one. I'm only confused in one. Uh, and what little I understand about Spanish, it keeps me confused. Um, well, last week we, we were on uh, Revelations chapter 6 and we were discussing um, the seals. And we got through six of the seals and I put together... Uh, la Last week, this uh, the Lamb opened the seals and heard the noise and thunder, and, and then there were some visions, and we had the four horsemen. So we had a lot of stuff going on last week as it pertains to the seals. But the seventh seal, which is primarily a, a function of Romans chapter 7 and 8, uh, is really, really interesting. Revelation 7 and 8. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, let's uh, go ahead and get started with in with Revelation chapter seven, and you're, it's always available to go back and look at what we talked about in our previous times together. I'll go ahead and read verses one through four, and I'm going to stop at the end of four. Okay. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. We could almost spend a, quite a bit of time on that first four verses. I put up, I got a, a PowerPoint of the four angels from the four winds and the four corners, four corners of the earth, and uh, talking about the land, the the trees, the seas. Uh, what a picture to d to denote things that we don't really know what's going on in our world. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, there's there's all kinds of different ideas that are given to this paragraph. Uh, a lot of people kind of run away from the. It's, it's another part of there's a judgment and then there's some kind of declaration where people are made righteous. Uh -huh. And you go, you find that all the way through Revelation. Um, the judgments that he's probably referring to here, I wrote them in my footnote. The judgments of God are mentioned in chapter 6, chapter 11, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. So you kind of get the idea that there's a pattern here where Somebody wants somebody to know about the judgments that are going to be made. And all those judgments are in the context of what you talked about last week. And that is that the Lamb of God is going to make those judgments. The Lamb, is, I think it's 17 times in Revelation, you either have Lamb or Lamb of God. And that Lamb is always involved with the judgments that came upon people, Gentile and Jewish. And we'll get there in a minute. Well, you know, the, the, the number... As you and I have talked about many times through this book of Revelation, people put significance on the number as far as a quantity, but do not put significance on what Jewish thought was. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the confusion, because there is something here that John writes from <clears throat> his vision, uh, do not harm the land or the seal until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Well, where, what, where does that happen? That's actually something that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, where he says that we have had a seal put on us. And what was the seal? The Holy Spirit. It was our seal of ownership, the same seal of ownership that's in, in essence being described here, you know. And, that, and that's why you have this indication in here. Don't hurt the earth. Don't do the damaging things to the earth because 
I've got there people there. There are people who are sealed, and, and a seal, you know what a seal does? It, it says, this is ownership. This is ownership. Yeah, if I put a seal on that, it's got my initials on it. It's mine. Right? Yeah. So their seal is in their foreheads. And he said, do not let these natural disasters come along first because of the fact that I got people there who are my people, and I don't want them hurt by, the, don't by want this the, seal. I, yeah, I, I don't want, th these are my folks, which would be inclusive of all of us. I mean, me, you, everyone who's ever lived, who's taken part, who's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, all of a sudden, that Paul says, we have a seal put on us, and that's that means we belong to someone else. And that's what this, until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. That's everyone who takes the name of Jesus as Lord. And let me mention one thing before we go back to the numbers. Behold, a great multitude from every nation uh, standing before the throne. Now look at this. And before the Lamb. There it is again. Yeah. Every time you have one of these worship scenes where there's a judgment involved, the Lamb is right. That Lamb that we looked at a couple of weeks ago that looked like it was... The one, only was, one who can open the seals. He's the only one who can open the seals. Plus, he looked like he had been killed. Yeah. That Lamb was on its last leg. Yeah. But the Lamb was resurrected, and then he's, the Lamb is in the middle of all these... Let's go back to the numbers just for a minute, and I'm not going to read this whole thing that says these were the 144,000. And like I told you a minute ago, I never dreamed in my preaching life that I would be addressing a TV audience to tell them what the 144,000 was <laughs> in Revelation 7. Because I'm going, I told you a little while ago, I was confused in both languages. I don't have a clue. And it's not for lack of effort. I have studied since uh, my freshman year in college things about Revelation. This is the one thing that, I, you know, if my life depended on, if they pushed me up against the wall and held a gun to my head and said, what's 144,000? I'd say, I don't know. Because I've looked at it from so many different angles. Now I can tell you some things that I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. The 144,000, he says, are exact numbers 12,000 from Gad, 12,000 from uh, Reuben, Judah, Judah. 12,000 from Reuben, Gad, Naphtali, Manasseh, uh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun. Now, I have two very good friends I haven't seen for a while, but I have two very good friends who told me one time that they go to a church that teaches the 144,000 are those who are going to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. They will eventually go to heaven. And there will be 144,000 humans in heaven. The rest of the saved don't get to go there. They're, they're going to be on a renewed earth. They're going to be on a re renovated earth. Mm -hmm. um, at the time I told them, and I respect them greatly and I respect their biblical wisdom. I don't agree with them about this. But I, if I can't tell you what I think it is, there's no use me arguing with you that you're wrong yeah. about that. Because so, the average church, and I'm talking about all denominations, the average church, if you walked in there and said, what's 144,000 in Revelation 7? You'd get the blankest stares you ever got in your life because commentaries just sometimes just s s slip over it. You, you might re and so what we have to look for here is these 144,000, they are the ones who have some kind of Jewish background. We don't know what it is. He doesn't say what it is. But it's 144,000 people that are, have done something special in the sight of God and because of that. Now, they said it's the Christian, it's the people who go to heaven, that's 144,000 and everybody else has to stay on the earth. That's okay with me. You know, if, if, I, if I'm not one of the 144,000 and he says you have to go to paradise on earth, I'll take that. Or would well, you rather have what's behind door number two? Well, according to that philosophy, uh, I'll be honest, the way I read it, only descendants of Israel are going to be the 144,000. So, I mean, if you're going to go literal. If you're going to go literal, it's 144,000 Jewish uh, men. Jewish men. And here's the other thing. Again, this is to help remind you that <clears throat> numbers don't mean the same thing that in our understanding. Like when Jesus told Peter, how many times, Peter asked, how many times I've got to forgive? And 70 times 7. Mm -hmm. 
Well, does that mean 490 times that's all you got to do? Can't no. wait for him to do that last time so you can bust him. Yeah, yeah, 491, <laughs> I'm, you're on, and I'm, it's on. Mm -hmm. No, that's not what it meant. Numbers in Jewish thought and understandings has, they didn't have value, they had significance understandings. And anytime you add a 10 to something, it means complete. And 12 meant, as we've talked about, you and I before the class, 12 met people of God. And so, one commentator I that I read, it says 12 times 12 times 10 times 10. And what that means is, in complete people of God was how he took the number of the 144,000. But, uh, you're still you're going to have people who are going to think this is literal instead of figurative. And one of the things you have to address this and address it to yourself is, what do these numbers mean? Are they a symbol or are they uh, literal? Because later on in Revelation, in chapter 14, it brings up this group again mm -hmm. and it says they're, oh. they're virgins and they're beheaded. Yeah. So Jewish virgins who are beheaded, they can be a part of 144,000. I'd just rather have that I, thing I'm, on the earth. Yeah, yeah, thing on yeah. the earth. Well, you know, and getting down to verse 9, another thing that references to a larger group after this, and this would be right after they saw the four angels standing on, and on the four corners of the earth and all this, this is pertaining to that. After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And they were wearing right, white robes and were holding palm branches in their hand and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And right here I put up another the uh, oh that's really neat picture of and the significance Are there are 144,000 people in that well there, we can't count them so <laughs> uh, I love the going back reference here what did God say to Abraham when he looked told him to look up into the stars it was numberless his descendants would can, be numberless. If you numberless. can count them, that's how many descendants you're going to have. That's the same thing that's going on yeah. in here. This is yeah. another reference back to Abraham and this numberless people that will be in with the Lamb, worshiping around Him. Um, well, can I say something else about the number? Sure. Okay. When, when people look at this number... Obviously, you have to figure out who it, or God is figuring out who is and who's not a part of that group. And like I said a little while ago, the two friends that I have who go to that church, they told me that both of them are part of the 144,000. I said, well, it's, it's Jewish. It, if that's what it means, if there's 12,000 12, for each And besides that, um, how do you know that? And yeah. they, they both said, God tells you. God speaks to you and tells you you are part of the 144,000. So the, the more we talked about, the more I kind of got away from that literal interpretation. They also told me, and I, and I didn't know this until I had that study with them, and like I said, they're great people, they're, they're moral people, they're, I respect their dignity, their character, I respect their biblical knowledge, but on this one I just have a little trouble. And, and the, one of the other things that really gave me trouble was they said at their church they have communion once a year. Mm. And when they have communion once a year, the 144,000 are allowed to partake of the communion. If you're not in 144,000, you're not allowed to take communion. So you can have communion at your, in your church one time a year and pass the plate, pass the bread, and pass the cup, and nobody takes it unless there's somebody there from that group. Yeah. Well, I think that's adding a little bit to the scriptures that we have. But like I said, if you're going to tell somebody they're wrong, you better have a, an al alternative device or an al alternative idea about what you're talking about. Well, and, and, and I feel, I, I'm going to say, I feel extremely confident of my understanding of the 144,000. That it is not a literal, but a figurative of complete 
And much like I said, in verse 9, it says that the, who these people were, and there was no one could count them. So and it has something to do with Judaism. It, and it it's, comes out of the promise of Abraham, yep. this, this, this idea. I mean, every one of these things, uh, from the listing of the tribes, from the counting of the stars, all are reference to a promise that God gave to Abraham and uh, he said he would bless all nations. Uh, there's been a d debate over lots of years. What was that? Was the blessing Jesus or was the blessing the Spirit? And I've always said yes. Yeah. <laughs> because without the one, you don't have the other. So. Uh, and like you said, it's a little easier to drop down in that paragraph and start talking about the great multitude. Because the great multitude, he, he describes who that great multitude is. He said, there were people from every nation from all tribes from all peoples from all tongues standing before the throne and before the lamb what he says is as a symbol there's going to be a group of people who have obeyed me and they have obeyed the they stood before the throne and they obeyed before the lord and nobody could count how many people there there was this great multitude in contrast to the 144,000 so these Jews that came along, and they did, when you read the New Testament, who said, well, they're not allowed to be a part of the yeah. kingdom of God. What's wrong with you? Don't you know this is a, this is a Jewish plan? This is a, a Jewish schedule that's taking place here. They're not allowed to be a part of that. And here, John, ha John, through the Spirit, says, no, that group of people comes from every nation. That's right. Every nation. Yeah. N um, you lost your exclusivity. Uh, Ooh. Verse 11, because we need to get rolling. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they and where did they come from? And I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are they who come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Um, again, giving another reference to who are these people. And now, um, the, the number uh, who come out of the great tribulation... Now, again, this is something that we talked about from the very beginning. What is Revelations intended to help? Um, now, and again, that's a judgment. That's a judgment. You, you, there was a great uh, problem, uprising, and and tribulation for the Jews in during the. From AD 60 something, if you want to take 66, your mirror, yeah. and going all the way up through AD 70 when the, uh, Rome comes in and just destroys a tremendous amount. Because there's a long time from that period to AD 300 when Rome finally officially recognizes mm -hmm. the Christian faith. For a long, for over 200 some years, they didn't. It was hell on earth. You were living right on the edge if you decide. Yeah, you didn't put up a sign that said all the Christians are going to be here at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah. Because you were, you were hiding. You, were, you, you worshipped in homes. You worshipped in privacy. Much like we have uh, followers of Jesus Christ in China today who in secret. It's illegal. Muslims, nations. Mm -hmm. I mean... Mm -hmm. I know for a lot of our listeners, maybe they don't know, but, but how many the Christian faith is exploding in a lot places. And do you know where it explodes the most? Where there's tribulation. Oh, yes. I was thinking of a geogra no. geographical place. You're no, exactly right. Whenever the world... When they get scattered because of the persecution, the explodes. church grows. It explodes yeah. because people want hope and... One of the things that I think is really interesting here is we mentioned how many times the lamb is referred to. Mm -hmm. 
Um, God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb and all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders of four living creatures. Those are the ones we were introduced to in chapter 4 and chapter 5. And it says, They stood before the throne and worshipped God. Now here's the image. God took the blood of the Lamb and made their garments white. Mm. Now I don't care if you're David Blaine or how good a magician you are. You can't take blood and dump it on robes and make it white. But he's, evidently, evident, you evidently you can. So he, he says, these are my people, the ones who wear the white robes, the ones who have obeyed the lamb mm -hmm. who, who offered the blood that made their Well, made there's their another reference white. in that thing, too, that sometimes is the palm branch, which is a representation of praise, which I keep going back one of the two themes of the book of Revelation, as far as my perception is, choose wisely and remember who you're serving and praising and worshiping. Because the two references that John gives in that thing is, one, the white, the white robes, who they are, they've chosen, and the palm branch, which represents praise and honor and glory to their king. The same thing that they threw down in front of Jesus when as he came walked into, into Jerusalem. Jerusalem into Jerusalem to some some to churches actually uh, still today they still have Palm Sunday Palm Sunday I'm a I, again Jewish tradition Eastern tradition had a tremendous amount of different symbols in it that doesn't translate into Western culture and, and we lose those things and you also have to remember that the seven letters that Jesus addressed these to that John addressed these letters to I think I'm right about this. They were all Gentile churches. Mm -hmm. Now, they had some Jews scattered here and there. Yeah. But mainly, the great majority of those churches were Gentile churches. Well, one, so they're dealing with two cultures. Yeah, one letter even says, we, I know some of the Jewish followers are, are uh, persecuting you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so... Uh, I'm going to go ahead and read... I can't, pa I can't pass over worship in Revelation. In verse 15, then we'll kind of close up 7. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in His temple. And He who sits on the throne will shelter them with His presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Um, again, the references to the worship all signify the significance of the Lamb, which, let's just face it, from 1 through 7, that is our big significant factor is who is the Lamb. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that He is the only one that can conquer. But we really have, still haven't opened the seventh seal of verse 8, verse 1. When He opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. Now this picture, this is one of those references that I have a hard time with. <laughs> well, I think it's pretty easy. All right, give it to me. I'm ready for it. All the things that are happening around this throne, um, you know, who knows how long they were there. Maybe mm -hmm. they were there for a day, five days, maybe they were for a year. And like you said, as you pick out those worship uh, plans and the, the worship ideals in in each chapter that's pretty much what each chapter is about mm -hmm. that there's going to be people worshiping something and somebody and if you worship the lamb and his father you're going to be okay so you got a choice you got two choices you can be in this group right here or you can be in this group that we're going to study in chapter 8 that just gets Hit, it hits by natural disasters, by plagues, by some a star named Wormwood. You're going to hit. You're going to get hit with all these things, but don't hit those people that are mine. Yeah, because they have followed the Lamb. It is a. I, I mean, I've I've heard several uh, different explanations. One, it's the aha moment. <gasps> the one, the thing that takes your breath away. That. Uh, or 
the moment in a movie that you've watched and something happens and you're just literally in shock yeah. and you just sit there and you ponder what's going on. Um, I mean, and you think how many people are doing that at the same time? Yeah. Because Evidently, there's, there's 144,000 people in that picture, and they're all getting hit with that thought, like you said, that this is what we're Unlimited supposed to do. Unlimited number of people, and there was nothing but pure silence. Even the angels <clears throat> were quiet. They never stopped praising God. You know what I think that silence means? I think that silence means they are, they are in suspense. They, they've it's seen rare, all these things, you know. They, what's what's a word when you when you're over, you know, when, stimulated. when you're overstimulated, you can't separate everything. That's kind of way they are. But when he starts, to, sudden, when, he, when he has this silence for half an hour, they are in suspense. They are in great expectation of what's going to happen. Because the seventh seal. Oh, I, I didn't get the. I kept looking for a, a PowerPoint picture to put up there for the seven seals, but they were they were all over the well, place. We've got other choices. You can get one for the seven trumpets. Yeah, well, I could have. I just did trumpets. Yeah, you know, uh, because there's a lot. There's a lot of things that are seven in this section of Revelation. Yes. Yeah, and we keep giving reference to it. The fact is, just it's complete uh, <clears throat> when he. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and the seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel, who had a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer, with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came pearls, peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That's about where we're going to have to end this week. But that is just... Um, well, the I'm seventh seal is, is, is scary. Mm -hmm. It's scary. Yeah. They're not all good things. No. When the angels are opening these scrolls, you really don't know what you're going to get. No. And the other part, too, uh, which it's almost like a, um, a, a, a another reference to scales, the balance of scales. In the very f of chapter 7, we're introduced to the fact that those with the seal of God uh, have received a form of protection but the seventh seal which when it's open reveals there's going to be some bad stuff. You better get out of the way. Better get out of the way. <laughs> well let me mention two things before we finish with chapter seven. I know we probably won't have time to go through eight but I'd like to encourage our listeners don't don't be afraid of something just because you can't figure it out or you don't understand no. it or you're having a difficulty with it. A lot of, the vast majority of people would not be able to tell you, including me, what that 144,000 was. But don't just throw it out the window and say, well, I'm not going to study certain things that I don't understand. Yeah. Because in this book, what we have in this book is a message that's valuable for all ages. These people in the first century who were Christians, who were devout, disciples they knew what the book was about and then it was revealed to them what the book was about so there are messages here that are valuable for for all ages and I don't mean all ages 10 15 I mean all the epoch, time periods time, all the time periods there are valuable messages here one thing we're going to have to look forward to as we start chapter 8 is John says it's going to get worse yeah this, if you think it's bad now it's going to get worse yeah <laughs> Who are the 144,000 supposedly? These are people who have gone through the tribulation. And then we open the seventh seal and we ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> it's like watching a bad movie. A, ba a scary movie. A scary bad movie. Yeah. And you think, okay, that was the crescendo moment of scariness. No way. <laughs> There's one more thing. <laughs> and the other thing I think we ought to keep in mind is from this point on to the end of Revelation... 
there are all these things, like I said a minute ago, there are all these things that um, are a part of a judgment scene. Uh -huh. And somebody's getting judged here. The, the main object of this book is there are people who obey God and follow the Lamb. There are people who are judged because they've made the wrong decisions about what, how they're going to live their life. So what I would suggest is, and, and I think this is a little easier than trying to figure out 144,000. When you go through this book and you start seeing all these judgment scenes, try to figure out who is being judged. Yeah. Now, most commentaries, and I agree with this 100%, most commentaries say that the enemy in Revelation is either Jerusalem or Rome. I think it's both. The, the Christians were being they were go going after by the by the Romans mm -hmm. and they were the Jews didn't like them either no I mean you've so got, uh, go through there and look at each chapter and say who's in here is this Rome or is this Jerusalem well using our revelations chapter 7 reference the ones who God has set aside are the ones who have the seal on their forehead and the only way you can get the seal on your forehead is to choose Jesus so yes. uh, that is our, <laughs> I guess it's either one or the other. I keep going back to that saying, you choose wisely. Revelation is choose wisely. And we haven't discussed this phrase very much in the past couple of weeks, but it's there all the time. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He who has ears to hear, let Do him hear. Do not listen to this and then turn away and disobey it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we are so glad you joined us, and I, I don't know, this book just keeps getting more and more exciting in, in the con as far as the context of what we're looking at. And I hope that uh, you are intrigued, as Steve and I are, in not necessarily to come to a complete conclusion to anything, but to look at what is representative of Jesus in this story, which is important in our lives. Anything you'd like to add before I say goodbye? Yeah, um, I'm going to go home after this session to not just a half an hour of silence. I'm going to go home to a, a, a house where Susie and I talk to each other every once in a while, but most of the time. But it's nothing like when the ten kids are there. And when they leave, that silence is just awful. Deafening, isn't it? Deafening. And I start thinking about how much I love those ten grandkids and then think how much this lamb loves, loves. us. And it's a big reference. It's, it's a great, great book. And it has revealed so many things to the people in the first century, but it has innumerable lessons that we can learn even in this age while the whole world is messed up. Mm-hmm. Indeed it is. Well, God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. And on, on behalf of Steve and I, see you next week. Thanks. Let's wave at him this way here. Goodbye.